Okay, good afternoon. My name is Kathy Betcher. Welcome to the Wellesley Free Library on a beautiful day. Thanks for coming out. This is going to be a great program. If you have uh, phones, can you silence them, please? Um, we have information, as I've um, always suggested to you, we have information on the tables, um, so check it out. Next week, our programming is really focused uh, around the book, um, the library book by Susan Orleans. And actually, this program today is part of that uh, Wellesley Reads Together series. So there are books available um, out in the lobby um, or in the browsing section and also programming next week. March 1st, we are back here with Jazz and the uh, Lance Martin will be here with his trio or duo, trio to get all together. And it's going to be an all request program. So come on, on out, come on for that. Sign up for the library newsletter, which we'll um, send to you in your email. Give us your feedback. We have a little short evaluation uh, on the table. We do this at all our programs. So give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And let's see, what else? Ah, OK, so that's it in library news. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's guest speakers. Byrne, Boston Byrne author Wayne Miller was a special agent criminal investigator and certified fire investigator for the U.S. Treasury Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms for 25 years. During that career, he examined more than 2,300 fire and explosion, explosion scenes and testified in more than 40 civil and criminal cases in federal and state courts. Wayne is joined today by lifelong Wellesley resident and Massachusetts broadcaster, uh, Broadcasters Hall of Fame member, Nat Whittemore. During his long photojournalism career at WBZ TV, Nat's coverage of breaking news, especially fires, brought him many accolades. Let's give a warm welcome to Wayne Miller and Nat Whittemore. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you to the Wellesley Free Library for hosting us. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <laughs> you are going to hear today evidence of treachery, corruption, and high crimes by police, fire, and other people. I haven't started any of my presentations that way. <laughs> I didn't even tell my wife I was going to do that. This case is forgotten by so many people. And anybody under the age of 55 doesn't even know about this case. This is such a big part of Boston history and Boston firefighter history. And you, can you imagine eight people joining together to burn building after building in Boston? There was a ninth conspirator eventually, but I'll explain that but eight of them were arsonists. All told, they burned 264 structures in Boston and four surrounding counties. And they were one Boston police officer, Robert Gablewski, two other police officers for the Boston Housing Authority, one Boston firefighter, Ray Norton, two other guys who have been called firefighters, an owner of a security company, and a couple other characters. And I use various names for these characters. Clowns, goofballs, domestic terrorists. I started using that term way back, long before you hear it like virtually every day on the news. And what I want to show you is some slides. A lot of these pictures are donated by retired Boston firefighter photographer for 30 plus years, Bill Noonan. He was generous enough to donate them for the book, for all my presentations, and for the potential film that may come up in this case. We have been contacted by producers, and I now have an actual media agent. So, this may go somewhere. When you hear about the story, or if you read it, how many have read it? About eight or ten. I've gotten so many contacts from Facebook, LinkedIn, that this should be made into a movie. 
And it should, not just because of fires. Fires are always very uh, highly visible. When you drive along the street and there is a building fire, you're going to stop because it's not something most lay people get to see too often in their lifetimes. They're hard for filmmakers to make a lot of fires, although you can watch Chicago fire and every single week they have some sort of computer generated and gas generated fires. But we have actual footage here from Nat Whittemore when he was riding around the streets of Boston doing a job that he loved. Not just being a cameraman and lugging around that 50, what, how, how? 50 pound, 50 pound camera, but Mr. Whittemore is a Boston fire buff. He's a member of an organization called the Boston Sparks Association. They are legitimate organizations. A lot of us might be Red Sox or Patriot fans in this audience. Well, these guys are also fans. They're fans of collecting equipment, memorabilia, having photographs, watching firefighter operations, and the fire itself. Not every one of them runs the fires, but Nat had the luxury of being paid to actually go to these fires. These gentlemen were also fire buffs. Now I call them gentlemen this time. That was a slip of the tongue. <laughs> These guys were fire buffs too. Two of them were actual members of the Boston Sparks Association. Two others had been rejected a couple of times and that plays into this whole story also. All these guys at one point in their life wanted to be a firefighter. Most of them wanted to be Boston firefighters because that's where the big job is around in this area. A lot of them grew up with their parents taking them to fire when they were kids. That doesn't mean you're going to become a fire setter. But when you start to look at everything else in their lives and where they were in their lives when this spree started, then you will recognize how they became firefighters. Uh, fire arsonist. Well, I wanted to show you first, I just added this. Uh, you're only the second group actually to see it Friday down at URI. I, I taught a fire forensic class down there. But you're only the second group. The reason is, a week ago I was in Reno, Nevada and I didn't show them too well how Boston was laid out and how these, where these guys set their fires. And from here I'm going to Georgia. Uh, Maryland, Philadelphia, Chicago, Arizona, Wisconsin, and I think I forgot one in there. <laughs> Hopefully. So there's quite a few states people don't know Boston. So, you know, Suffolk County, whoops, I did the wrong one. Suffolk County is roughly, you can see the airport over here, uh, and, you know, you're into Chelsea, just Cambridge over here on the other side of the Charles River, downtown Boston. You get uh, Jamaica Plain, Roxbury, Dorchester, Hyde Park, down into this area. And then you get out on the highways. And these guys concentrated in the city of Boston first. I'll tell you the reasons they started expanding out, but they did. They went to Norfolk County. They went to Middlesex, Essex, and Worcester County. This is only the first 107 fires they set. I just did this like last Wednesday night. Finally, I put it on a map, and I'm gonna to try to add it to the book somehow, so people can see in the book. 107 of them. Let me try to go to Google Earth for a second. I mean, that's a slide, but let me go to Google Earth for a second. You all know why they set their fires? Probably not, except for the people who read it. When these guys were buffing, buffing fires or sparking fires around Boston, they didn't know each other ahead of time. They met each other in a Howard Johnson's parking lot. That's almost the area that they spread out to eventually, west and north and south. But I want to show you very close downtown area. 
Look at all the pins that are grouped together. And when we work serial larson cases, we have a certain, we look at patterns that people set their fires. The very first fire, if I get just a little closer, you're gonna see the word first. Anybody see that word yet? Is it on the screen? Oh yeah. Right there. That's Blanchard Street in Roxbury, the very first fire. November 4th, 1980, master arsonist-to-be, Greg Bemis, the youngest one in the group at that point in time. He had come from Acton in the Stowe area. He grew up, his mother used to take him to fires. He loved fires, and he wanted to be a Boston firefighter. He started listening to the radio, young teenage kid, and starting to learn the fireboxes. I got asked down at URI by a student, what's a firebox? <laughs> you know, I don't know how many are out here nowadays, but it's that little house-shaped box, mainly red, and they could be some other colors. But they were uh, in all the neighborhoods in Boston. And these residential neighborhoods, Mattapan, Roxbury, Dorchester, Jamaica Plain, Charlestown, South Boston, they were on pedestals or on utility poles or on the side of a building type of thing. So if you rode down any street, you could pull these fireboxes. How did they get on that? They're going back to 1850. Yes, they do. If you, I try to give a little history of everything in the book and just in a few lines, but they do go back to the 1850 period, and Boston is the first city that had fireboxes. So these guys, when Prop 2 and a half came in, it was November 1980, the same day as Greg Bemis turned 20 years old, the same day Ronald Reagan was elected. The citizens of Massachusetts voted in Prop 2 and a half. You know that tax cutting measure that limits the tax to 2 and a half percent of your property value? Well, because of that, the cities and towns didn't know where money was going to come from to pay the people who work for the city. And who's the usual suspects? Teachers, firefighters, and police. Well, I'm going to stick just with the fire department in this case. Boston lost 600 firefighter positions in a very short period of time, through 1981 into 1982. 200 through a rapid attrition, laying off, I mean, retiring and that type of thing. And then 400 got pink slips. They had 1,700, so when you take 600 away, that is almost like 40% of the department. Fire companies, firehouses closed. So around 20 firehouses closed around the city. And people would, they would paint on the door, big giant letters, closed. So you couldn't run up to that fire department and notify them that you just saw a fire across the street. Apparatus, the ladders and the the engines would be sitting idle. Can you imagine? My wife was in, living in East Boston. And East Boston is a prime example. There's only a couple firehouses over there. So if you close one, when you need help, where does it have to come from? Downtown, and it wasn't Ted Williams Tunnel at that point in time. She lived in a three-decker. It wasn't quite 1982 when this happened, but four triple-deckers burned, including the one that she was in with our five, her five-year-old son. And she didn't even know it. When the first one burned, it carried into hers before she knew about it. And that's what can happen in this city of so many tight buildings. So when you start shutting down firehouses, you get this delayed response. How did I bring that up closer a second ago? <laughs> oh, there it is. So just look at this grouping. Now, as, again, as an investigator, the ATF arson group was formed in March 1982. It's a task force group. It's just pure coincidence. They set that first fire I listed there, February 18, 1982, 
And the federal government, in their infinite wisdom, had four arson task force cities in the country, LA, Chicago, New York, and Boston, because of a long history of a lot of fires in the city. They figured that they would give the city some relief by in addition to their local and state people, some federal agents who were trained in doing fire investigation. And we had the luxury of being criminal investigators, knowing how to investigate crime, where firefighters typically knew how to investigate fires, but not the crime. Boston did have a Boston police officer assigned, so he knew how to do interviews, etc. But when you get complicated fire cases, somebody setting multiple fires, somebody setting them for profit, and you're in multiple jurisdictions, you set two in Boston, you set two in Norfolk County, et cetera. Boston and Norfolk County didn't actually talk back then that much, and this way the jurisdiction of the federal government could help if you went across city, state lines, those type of things. So we were there to assist state and local. So the task force city started virtually two to three weeks after their very first fire by pure coincidence. They didn't know we existed. We didn't know this group existed. Oh, that's because of the school board. Get out of that one. There we go. This is the first 107 fires. This was by October or less in the city of Boston. 107 set between February and October. What happened? It says frequency out of range. Uh, let me go back here for a second. I'll keep it on this instead of going to the, I think that works, yes. This is what Boston firefighters had to get used to in 1982. Because these guys had backgrounds in fires and knew the Boston firefighter operations, and they operated under cover of darkness, they would ride around the city in their Nerf cruisers. What's a Nerf? Something Nerf. It's like those little fake basketballs or footballs. Well, the Nerf cruisers are their own personal mock cruisers. They're black LTDs with the black walls, the antennas, the black uh, Chevy sedans. They would ride around like that in the cities, and they hit the poorer sections of the city because there were so many abandoned buildings. I don't think it had anything to do with race at that point in time. Not that they were fond of black firefighters on the job and taking their jobs or anything like that. But they hit these areas of the city, the Mattapans and the Dorchesters and the Roxburys in Southie, and because they had so many abandoned structures, houses that nobody's living in anymore. Uh, people left for various reasons. And the city owned some of them because they were just taken over after nobody paid their taxes, et cetera. That one was Blanchard Street. Uh, this was unoccupied also, but this is right on Dot Ave, Dorchester Ave. Only about a quarter mile, half a mile at the most, away from a second fire they set that night. This went to multiple alarms. They could get away with anything when you step out of that black cruiser and somebody might see you in a neighborhood that's predominantly black and say, there's no white guy in their right mind would be out here at 2 a.m. It must be the cops stepping out of that cruiser, that type of thing. So nobody questioned them. Even after a fire started five minutes after you saw these people, you wouldn't believe how many times they got away with what they did, how state troopers stopped them on Route 1 in Foxborough. Five minutes later, a fire develops in the building that they had just set in between getting stopped and getting away. This one, Dot Ave, they set 
right in that little alleyway, that walkway between houses, no more than four feet wide. Now, they used an incendiary device. When they first got together and said, what are we going to do about helping the city of Boston getting these firefighters back, this, this bizarre Robin Hood type of mentality, instead of stealing from the rich, giving to the poor, we are going to burn enough buildings so that the citizens scream and the press picks it up and Kevin White will listen and not use these people as pawns. So they said, well, let's, let's tie the cops up. Let's break windows of cars, throwing bricks, breaking windows. They collect bricks in vacant lots and throw them through windows. Nothing much happened with that. Trying to tie the cops up just doing these reports, vandalism, so they're not out there uh, responding to a homicide or a theft, uh, you know, a robbery type of thing. So they quickly graduated to a pellet gun. A hundred cars blown out windows in a night. Wouldn't you be a little upset coming out in the morning? Yeah. That didn't cause any stir. So they said, what are we going to do? The only way we're going to stir up enough attention is Saudi set fires. You're very familiar with the back bay, coming in on Storo Drive. You look over to your right when you're coming in on Storo and you got the back side of all the brownstones. There's dumpsters behind each and every one. They put a little simple device, just a matchbook with a cigarette. Tossed it, tossed it, tossed it, and tossed it. They'd set a dozen or more. And they'd even go over to the Cambridge side and watch their entertainment and laugh at what they're listening to because they're listening to Boston Fire respond to these. Now, the area of the Back Bay and stuff like that, there's only a couple firehouses around, so fire companies had to come from further areas. And they didn't even know what address they were going to or where they were coming from. When they got to a fire, they didn't know exactly where it was. They just knew they were at a fire. So these guys would laugh. It would be fun for these characters. So this one on Dot Ave was on June 3rd, uh, yeah, June 3rd, 1982. Multiple alarm fire. Fire quickly races up the sides of these buildings. And there's a bunch of fire science that I'm not going to teach this group. But uh, the thing about Boston area that I learned so much about by working here and then working this case, triple deckers. You can go to New York and Rhode Island, and you don't get triple deckers like this. You get a lot of two families, maybe, but you don't get three families. And in Brockton, we were just in Brockton the other night, they actually have four families, and even one, five family. And it's just a wooden structure like these. But they would set triple deckers on fire. I mean, it's a little monotonous in my book at times in my own head when I read about it. And we discussed that, putting it in. When you're talking about them setting 264 fires, I tried to narrow it down to ones that weren't very spectacular. I just maybe just mentioned them in a line or two. But the reason I kept mentioning them is because by summertime, they were setting three, four, five, up to seven fires in a night. And I wanted you to see that repetition. And that's why, you know, some people, especially, again, non-fire people, might think it's just a little monotonous in that area, but you quickly get to some of the juice in the matter of this case. The importance of this one is the next one they set. Sparrow Toy Company in South Boston on D Street. This building is 1,000 feet long, 300 feet wide. I'm going to shut the volume down on this. Nine alarm fire is the biggest Boston can count up to. They also get something that a lot of people call mutual aid. They don't call it that here in Boston. What do they? It's 
Mutual. Do they? But they had special call, they called it. Oh, special call. That's because after the news... Put your mic. Put your mic. With the multiple alarm fires, when they get up to fit the fifth alarm, automatically different cities and towns come into Boston, and that increases as they go up to the ninth alarm. After the ninth alarm, that ex uh, exceeds what's on the uh, assignment card, so then they start special calling additional mutual aid from distant cities and towns. And that, in this case, this engine was special called from Cambridge instead of covering they came right to the fire. Prior to this fire, they had set other fires uh, before this one. So the first engine in to the, when this was first reported was a uh, covering engine from Dorchester. Wasn't that familiar with the area. This formerly was the New York, New Haven, and Hartford railroad yards in South Boston, which is why all those warehouses run parallel with railroad tracks in the middle. That's where the freight trains would come in, unload, or, or load up with uh, new products, and off they'd go. So the importance of Sparrow Toy is it's no longer an abandoned house. It is now a commercial building that was actually a working business. Sparrow Toy imported cheap Chinese toys, stuffed toys and plastic toys, all in boxes stacked in that warehouse. Now, I thought I paused that thing. Okay. The device. Now, back in 1982 or so, or 84, I wouldn't have explained the device to a crowd such as this, because you don't tell lay people how to set fires. <laughs> But today, with the internet, it's all in the book, fully described. It's court documented. It's public record. You can find any way to set a fire nowadays, so you don't need my help. But these guys would walk around with a lunch bag, a brown paper lunch bag, just nonchalant down the street. Nobody would suspect anything. In the lunch bag was a Ziploc baggie, Coleman lantern fuel. They tried gasoline. Gasoline's a little more volatile and eats through the plastic bags. A little tissue on top, and then they took, when they placed that device, when they're ready, and they placed it against the side, side of the triple deckers with that asphalt shingles. You know what the asphalt shingles are? Like on the roof? Well, the houses are sided with them. They have a nickname, gas shingles, because it's solid gasoline is all it is. And if you light that on fire, it rapidly develops. So they would take that device, place it, put that lit cigarette in the matchbooks, and put it right in the bag. And that's how they set these fires. They did this for the first 50 or 60, at least, before they graduated to something else, which we'll show you shortly. But because of that, they placed that. Did you see some firefighters in Sparrow Toy tearing a wall down? Yeah, it was falling, too, and it fell right to the ground. Well, the only place they could set that fire, because the outside was basically non-combustible, was this one area that had tar paper, sort of like gas shingles, right over planks or plywood, and that was in the rear by the railroad tracks. And they placed the device there. It went up the wall, and it happened to be a big, they, I don't, they didn't plan this because I have now talked to at least four of these arsonists, and I know the details. So they didn't know about the big fan that you put in those industrial warehouses to keep it cool during the summertime. So it carried inside the fan and made its way inside the building and became that monstrous fire. Some 33 firefighters did get hurt that night, none of them with very serious injuries and uh, none of them life-threatening. But can you imagine? Now, these guys all want to be firefighters. They're all friends with firefighters. They're, they're fire buffs. They, they go to the picnics with these guys. They, they ate in the firehouses at dinner time with some of these guys. And yet, they're setting fires that are hurting firefighters. And at the same time, 
the firefighters, it's a, such a weird thing for them because their brothers have been laid off, a lot of them. A lot of people are upset and angry. But at the same time, they like the activity because they're firefighters who like to fight fires, first of all. And second, when they realize that there's an uptick, a major uptick in the number of fires in the city of Boston, that this might help in some weird way. But yet, we're losing, we're hurting firefighters who can't come on the job for a while, that type of thing. So it's a very strange relationship, not only between them, but amongst the firefighters themselves. Some good shots by Bill Noonan. Uh, because it's not on a full slide, it's not given his name, but his name is on the bottom of each one of these. Again, because of delayed response, so many of these fires grew to be much larger than they should have. And these guys knew something else. The fireboxes I mentioned, well, one night there happened to be a car fire. Somebody stripped the car, a stolen vehicle, and stripped it and set it on fire. And these guys came upon it. So they called it in on one of those voice boxes. You open the door and you can actually talk to fire alarm and tell them, we got a fire here on you know, Morton and Blue Hill Ave type of thing. Well, all it did was give them a lot of static, <laughs> static. And it, it pissed off Bobby Gablewski, the Boston cop. He took that thing and just gave it a hard tug. And it came right off its pedestal. And for some reason, they had wire cutters in the car with them and just cut the wires and threw it in the car. Boston, in any one year, would have one box missing. That year, there were 14 boxes missing. Not just for collector's items, but because if you have a firehouse that's closed here, and you're in a neighborhood in the middle of the night with people sleeping. How many people are going to knock on the door in the middle of the night? If you have a box missing, somebody driving along the road who sees a fire now has to find someplace else to report this fire. Well, how many pay phones in those residential areas that weren't vandalized already with the receivers cut off? That type of thing. So every minute in a fire growth increases a fire excrementally. I used to write term. Also, no cell phones in those days. Right. Remember, folks, this case couldn't even happen today, excrementally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, full of crap. <laughs> but exponentially, sorry. You've got to realize this is 1982 to 1984. There are no cell phones on the street. There are no... Uh, GPS systems in use, and surveillance cameras. There's virtually zero at that point in time. This case could not happen today. Besides the fact that property values are so high, there's virtually no vacant buildings in the city of Boston that these guys could burn today. You know, anything that was there was either knocked down or rebuilt or built new. On the far left, it says June 11, 1982. I just wanted to show you this particular slide. Nine alarm fire in Brookside Ave, Jamaica Plain. Six alarm fire in Dorchester. Three alarm fire in Dorchester. A five alarm fire in Jamaica Plain. And at least three other fires, right, Matt? Yeah, yes, and then shortly, uh Thereafter, they had another one down in uh, Dudley Station. This was the busiest night in Boston Fire Department history. Think about all the cutbacks. How could they respond to this? Look at this chief. Go ahead, Matt. This is a uh, division deputy chief. Uh, he's in charge of half the city, and that was all that responded on the initial call for this building 
And that's what he found when he got out of his car. He started calling for additional assistance. And the first engine in was from Dedham and another engine from Norwood and the Boston Fire Alarm Office, uh, which had also had people laid off or laid off. Uh, they were frantically calling with the telephones to various cities begging for help. Uh, a lot of the uh, inner city fire radio in those days was just limited to the metropolitan area and they were reaching way out for anything that they could get. So this, this chief uh, was really overwhelmed. You can just imagine what's going through his head and he shrugs his shoulders probably and says, what are we gonna do with this? And you wanna know something? They set that same building twice because it was so big, that's only a portion of it. Does this look familiar? Front of the book? That photograph was taken by Master Us and this Greg Bemis. This building, right here. I give him credit on the back. What do you call him? I did, no, I just said Greg Bemis. Plus better than 20 years at uh, being housed at federal expense. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this cover was done by our future son-in-law. Uh, front and back, Mike Clark. Um, he's a graphic designer, and he did uh, my website also, burnbostonburn.com. And uh, I think he did a great job with it. Up top, the subtitle for my book, anyway, is The Largest Arson Case in the History of the Country. Now, in the Boston area, I don't have to really justify that too much. But out in Reno, Nevada, and I just read my friend's book who invited me to Reno. He wrote a book on serial arsonists. And one is named John Orr. In California, he was the, one of the best top fire investigators in the state of California. Well, half the reason he was the best is because he set a bunch of those fires that he was telling them where it started. But he killed a couple people, and he's doing life in prison. He did not confess to the number of fires he set, which a lot of them were wildland fires, but we know the devastation they can do now. Out here, we don't pay attention to wildland fires. If we get two to 400 acres, it's a major story on the evening news. But out there, it's, it's half the size of the state of Rhode Island. You know? So John Orr didn't confess, but they assume in 20 years of setting fires that he might have set one to 2,000. But we don't know that for sure. There are other people. Uh, Thomas Sweat from the Washington, D.C. area got caught a few years back by ATF and a uh, task force down there. And he set fires individually for about 20 years. And he confessed to about 350, which we have 264 buildings and at least 100 dumpsters, which I didn't count, and we have eight arsonists in this case, and no other case around had eight arsonists who set this many fires. So I didn't tell Mike that this should have been in quotation marks because who made that quote? Somebody very famous here in the state, U.S. attorney at the time, governor later on, presidential candidate, Bill Weld. So it should have been quotation marks. I didn't give Mike that direction, I didn't make him correct it, and he put a period at the end. So I say this is the largest arson case in the history of the country, period. <laughs> these guys would go to these fires regularly. I mean, this is what these sparks would do, these fire buffs would do, not just them, not just this group, but dozens would meet in various locations, such as the whole Howard Johnson's parking lot near fire headquarters, uh, a mobile gas station, a donut shop. Oh, yeah, and down at Edward Everett Square, which is right down the street from Boston Fire Headquarters. Same building, different view. I don't know if it's the same day or the, the, other day, the next day. I, it was, didn't happen back to back. They did it like uh, months apart. 
The reason we show this one is because that is the night of June 11th at this fire. Norwood was the first responder to that particular fire. My second daughter was born June 25th, 1982. They set six multiple alarm fires that night. And you can see as a dad that I'm with my wife and my one-year-old daughter and my second daughter, but also wanting to be out here when they set six fires that night. I absolutely love this picture. But whoops, for non-firefighters, you see this hose line he's got in his hand? It's got no water in it. And that is a fully involved triple decker. And it's already extending to the side to the next building. And this was routine during this spree. Yes, they had a lot of failures and not so good ones. I mean, nobody's going to photograph those. Back at the other Jamaica playing building. He looks like he's smoking a cigarette. I think he's on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll put it, yes. That's, he's, he's on the radio. This one here, which we have... Um, information on is the Boston Sparks Club building where they were housed. They, they rented space upstairs. This is uh, Zeola Brothers plumbing and mechanical business in Southie. Nat, did you go to this one? Yeah, this, uh, the two members uh, that had been refused admission to the Boston Sparks Association were very bitter. And so they convinced the two other group, of this uh, arson group that uh, who belonged to the Sparks Club, that they wanted to retaliate. At one point in time, they were thinking of uh, trying to set fire to the first floor when the club had a uh, meeting in progress. But that was, uh, they, they didn't do that. They went up with a, uh, device and got it going. There was considerable delay in the uh, transmitting of the alarm for the fire. Fire went to three alarms. It was a di difficult to uh, work because it's an old building. The first engine in was laying a line up the fire escape trying to uh, knock down the flames and enter in there with a the big line to uh, continue trying to control the fire. Finally, the uh, Chief ordered all firefighters out of the building. He was afraid of a collapse. This is a personal attack on the legitimate fire buffs on their club where they have memorabilia and stuff. They lost quite a bit of... Oh, irreplaceable. They had a whole series of uh, old uh, buckets. When Boston first uh, became organized, as a city or a municipality in the 1600s, one of the first things they did was to uh, have every person uh, at their home have two buckets, two uh, leather buckets. So when the church bells rang, you threw out your buckets and they arranged for a bucket uh, brigade. The men and boys went to the water source, handed the loaded buckets up to the fire, and the uh, women and girls took the buckets back to the water source. I don't want to give away everything in the book, but there's a lot of detail that they put into setting this particular fire and planning so that they wouldn't get caught. Another one. Another one. There is a beautiful Boston Sparks Association location uh, at the Boston Fire Museum on 344 Congress Street, just right down the street from the Children's Museum, same side of the street. It's a uh, firehouse that was built in 1891. That entire area of South Boston used to be all tidal marshland until the uh, Great Boston Fire of 1870. Uh, and 700 buildings burned down, destroyed 30 acres of buildings, and they took all the debris from that area and filled that whole area of South Boston in, now in, which is now known as the Seaport area. 
Rents have gone up a great deal since we got that buy a house. Now, these are the type of nights Joyce's dad and brother are both captains of the Revere Fire Department. And these are the type of nights, you know, firefighters can get hurt very easily with all the ice. Yeah, maybe when they're up close to the fire, it can keep them a little bit warm. And at the other end of the scale is those 90 humid degree days and you've got all your gear on. As a fire investigator myself, through 38 years of actually going to scenes, uh, my coldest one was minus 18 degrees the entire day up in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. And my hottest, my recollection, the worst one I did was right on Route 1 in Dedham, right at the Boston line just about. There's still a, uh, it's almost like a Taco Bell and there used to be a sub shop and a donut all in one building. And they had neon lighting around the roof line. And neon lighting used to catch on fire uh, on a fairly regular occasion. In order to collect the evidence of that fire, a non-criminal event, all of the neon lighting materials, transformers and wiring had to be collected. The fire starts up at the attic level and that's where I had to be when it was 90 plus humid degrees for three days collecting each piece. And every day I'd come out of there as black as a sweater, just from the char that stuck to my body. And those are the days you're saying, why am I doing this? you want to say anything. You... you know, what's funny about this book is so many people have come up to me and said, uh, remembrances about the story now, and that now that they've read it or heard my speech. You know, the firefighter up on this tower here said, that was me, <laughs> you know, just a couple weeks ago. And I'm getting emails from people telling about parts of the story that I never heard about. And I'm getting uh, details from people all over the place and thanking me for this type of story. So they used to be fire buffs. There's another guy, a fire buff, another guy, a fire buff. And he says, I used to go out there and I didn't know all this was quite like this, you know, happening. One, one, one uh, Boston firefighter came up to me for one of the pictures that we had and uh, the picture showed a lieutenant from a ladder company in Dorchester and he said, that's my father. I don't have anything of a, at a fire. Could you make a copy? So naturally, we got him a copy. But it's just amazing how many people have come up uh, to us and told us things like that. Exactly. Uh, this particular four story, if I, I, I'll get to it again, but this was in the very first fire. It's directly across the street. The first house that they burned was here. A year later, they burned this four-story brick. And as you can see, it completely collapsed. Firefighter looks a little too close to me. You can see the elevated train. It's got to be washing the street. This was uh, Dudley Station, as it was known at the down at uh, Washington, at the end of Shamit Avenue and Roxbury Street, it was a large seven-story brick building that uh, was right up to, by the MBTA. It uh, finally completely burned and most of it collapsed. And they shut the MD, MBTA down for several days until they got everything out of there. What were we investigators doing while this is going on? That's Why a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> so the, arts, the, the arson task force had eight investigators plus Lieutenant Steve McLaughlin from the arson squad, Boston Arson, assigned to us cross-designated uh, deputized as a U.S. Marshal. So he could be privy to any grand jury that we might eventually have, that type of thing. And he could actually talk to the Boston Arson guys and he could talk to us and that way the exchange of information could go back and forth. At least, hopefully, that's what we were going to have. So, Boston Austin was running from fire to fire to fire. Now, you know, they, they, they work shifts, and they run to these fires, and then they're off, and somebody else doesn't actually pick up that fire right away. They wait until they come back on to further investigate it. 
At each and every one of these fires, you did have to figure out ownership, speak to an owner, a tenant if there was rent, uh, rental involved, uh, employees, uh, ex-employees, business competitors. You had to examine an awful lot related to the commercial ones. They started doing a couple tire shops in Blue Hill Ave. They did uh, uh, lumber yards, uh, several of them. Um, other commercial buildings they did along the way. So a lot has to be done. And when you're talking about 264 fires in less than 24 months, that's a lot of work to be done. And we were new to the arson business ourselves, and we had meetings with Boston, Boston police and fire, not really the state fire marshal until they started going outside town, and I'll speak on that a little bit more in a moment. This particular church fire on Tremont, where's on Clarendon Street between uh, Tremont and Columbus Avenue, right, right at the, uh, the end of Arlington Street. That's the one I want to show you. That's a dramatic photo. That beautiful stained glass window up there is no longer. One of the things about the Boston Arson Squad, uh, it's very limited manpower, it was usually an officer and two investigators, so that when they had those number of fires at, at night, they were way behind. And of course, uh, Kevin from Heaven, the mayor, uh, had banned any overtime for them, so that uh, they, they just couldn't keep up with the, uh, with the series of fires. Also back, in the, the reason there were so many fires in the 70s here and in the Bronx and other cities, is because a lot of the fire departments, including Boston, members who were part of the arson squad were often guys near retirement, uh, trained only maybe a week in investigation, um, guys who gotten hurt on a truck and can no longer perform out in the street, not necessarily someone who wants to investigate fires. Uh, just in comparison now, I have 3,000 hours of classroom training and I have personally set, I'm not confessing here. You have the right to remain <laughs> silent. <laughs> 100 training fires. Uh, I've been on the inside while the fire grew around me, that type of thing. We have computerized them. We have uh, videotaped them from inside and outside. And we've done a lot of training with these. And Boston Fire, over the past 35 years, has also <coughs> grown in education and experience and guys who want to do it more, and younger guys, not guys who are no longer at retirement age. There's a lot of younger guys in the, in the squad. You compare Boston with, say, the New York City Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, down there, they all have to be college graduates. One of the great things that they have in New York City is the fire marshals uh, can force a person to give them a deposition, which is under pains of perjury. And it's a great tool in aiding and uh, encouraging people to come forth with the truth. Mm. As opposed to uh, the federal investigators, while it's a crime to uh, lie to them, uh, it's seldom uh, used unless you really want to pressure a uh, person because the, uh, the pain of a guilty verdict is a considerable amount of time in the uh, federal system. By midsummer, these guys wanted their motive known. People were saying, you know, who set any fires? And the commissioner said, you know, kids who are off in the summertime, they're doing it. You know, just kids in the neighborhood. Uh, people coming in, you know, immigrants were setting these fires. Um, you know, there was a lot of scuttlebutt, but no real suspects. Guys on the street like Nat and his good friend, my good friend, Ed Fowler, who was a Cambridge fire investigator, these guys spent hours and hours on the street themselves. They had a lot of suspicions about some of these guys. But yet, we had laid off firefighters by the hundreds who could be suspect, right? I mean, you're gonna be angry that you got laid off. So you could have, we, we thought the union at one point, you know, not, not the union itself, but union members could be setting these fires. 
Well, this letter was sent to try to clarify that. This was sent to WBZ because they were out there covering the fires, because they liked Nat. <laughs> and WBZ did the right thing. They called over the Boston Fire. Boston Fire came and picked it up, brought it over to Boston PD, fingerprinted this, and only came up with a couple smudges. Now, this was done like a Hollywood movie. The letters all cut out by who? Who do you think did it? Greg Bemis, master arsonist. I mean, we got eight other arsonists in this group, but every time it, it's Greg's name. So if you can't read the small stuff, I'm Mr. Flair. You know me as the Friday Firebug. Now, what, those two names right there, the press. I'm going to start blaming the press and media. They pick up on names, Mr. Friday Firebug, because the fire pattern that went throughout the summer was mainly after midnight on Thursday, early Friday morning, between midnight and, say, 5 a.m. So that's where the Friday firebug. Nobody really knows where Mr. Flair came from, but Mr. Bemis loved that moniker for himself. I'm Mr. Flair. You know me as the Friday firebug. I will continue till all deactivated police and fire equipment is brought back. And down the bottom where you can't see, it says... If abandoned buildings are torn down, we will target occupied buildings. This is a threat letter, another nice charge under the federal system. Now, this letter got put by Boston ID section into a file drawer. It didn't get on TV. Their hope for this getting on TV and spreading their reasons for setting the fires didn't happen. And ATF never found out about this letter until the Boston police officer, the first one who came in the door, Robert Grabluski, told us about it and said, we sent it to BZ and then we found out that it was this chain and our agent went over to Boston ID and they took it out of a file drawer. Not that ATF could have done anything much better with it back in 1982, but by 1984, they sent it to the lab that we have, and they got a usable print, and we now had somebody to compare it to, Greg Bemis, one print. So we knew how to, who to charge with it. One of the things that WBZ, it, the book, the uh, letter was opened by the assign, assignment editor. He immediately took it into the news director, and then they called the authorities. No one at, uh, in the news department including myself, had any idea of it. This is a fire up on Center Street one busy night. Uh, they had multiple alarm fires all in progress. They had very limited apparatus to send, and there was very poor low pressure up on the hill on Center Street because of the, the other fires. Shortly after this fire was contained and uh, knocked down, but they still had a lot of firefighters tied up there overhauling, another fire broke out down in Dudley uh, Station. Look how much water they have. <laughs> now, spent so much time with Greg Bemis and so much time with Robert Gabluski, two guys who testified in eventual trial. I spent two to four hundred hours with each one, debriefing them. We actually drove to each one of these addresses. We drove to each address. Doesn't matter if it's a vacant lot, a building still that's just uh, all charred, or, or what it was, rebuilt. But I would say to these guys, and we would record it, I would say, explain what happened. And Greg, his memory was so good. We jumped over the fence, we ran through the backyard, we placed the device up against the gas shingles. And oh yeah, the shingles were green. That's his memory. And he testified that same way. He, he was so good. He was like a star expert witness. Grabowski was a, took quite a few dings up there. But uh, when Greg went to prison, he typed 166 pages, single spaced, a journal. I have that journal. 
That journal was, is a major part of this book. When you look at the dialogue that's in this book, it makes it sound like fiction. It's actual, true dialogue. Greg told me in 84 about that, and when he went to prison, he typed it, and now, folks, don't be too harsh on me. I have a relationship with Greg Bemis today. His birthday was November 4th. I took him out to dinner on November 6th. I've been in his living room several times. He has supplied additional information, not only before the book was finished, but also now I can use when I'm speaking to people. He has a different last name. He did go into witness security when he was in prison. He got a little different last name. And he sells fire equipment today, or he, he installs fire equipment. He's not too far away from this. Uh, one of the training fires we set in Wayland or something many years ago, after Greg had gotten out, he was parked right across the street. He knew we were going to be setting this building on fire, and I went over and knocked on his window of his vehicle and talked to him for a bit. In a sense, I'm using Greg. He knows it, in a sense, and he's using me. It's really weird when we pulled off 495 just before Christmas when he said, I need four books. And uh, I had Joyce with me. And so I introduced Joyce. She's heard so much about him. Greg called our, our house. And um, so I need four books as Christmas presents about his crimes. <laughs> He's given these books. So it's very strange relationships. Well, you may. And anybody can, anytime, just raise. How can I? On the face of it, you would say he's a regular character. But I'm going to show you a slide. Oh, Chronicle, by the way, played the full half hour on this story. Very unusual. You know, you see those five-minute clips, but Chronicle played the whole thing. It's also coming up this coming Friday. Yep. This the 28th. Chronicle is again showing it. They're going to re-air this Friday at 7.30. We asked Greg to be part of this, to give a different aspect to the show. He declined because even if you blackened him out and gave his voice something different, there's too many people that might. He didn't want to interfere with his boss's business. His boss knows who he is, and he knows him by his Bemis name and by his present name. But he didn't want to partake, except I said, how about if they email you some questions and you answer those? Anything you're comfortable with. And he gave back some responses. I have that slide up there. I'm going to show it to you before we quit. But uh, it's a very strange, you know, I spent so many hours with him and saw his human side. I know some of his background, and I know partially why he became an arsonist. I can't forgive him for that or forget entirely. And I'll tell you, when I talk to a group of Boston firefighters, I'll bet you three out of every four would like to see him in prison the rest of his life. And I can't blame them for that either. One of the other things about Greg Beam is while he's out uh, selling or delivering firefighting equipment, he wanted it into the Wayland Fire Headquarters and was immediately spotted by the fire chief who knew who he was and very loudly and clearly made it uh, very obvious that he never wanted to see him in the town of Wayland again. This is the Bartlett building. This was a fire, apparently was started on the top floor. The building was vacant, was boarded up, utilities were off, uh, and it started at dawn after the other buildings the night before had all been burning. So at first it was believed to be part of the arson group. Uh, it was a very serious fire, and firefighters were really endangered by the 
collapsing uh, sections of wall. As, and it was right now there by Dudley Station, which shut down the MBTA and all the traffic. As uh, engines would become available in other fires, then they'd be brought into this one. But uh, fortunately, none of the firefighters were injured by the uh, falling walls. It just kept dropping down from the top floor right, right to the bottom. Again, it's another building that had a delayed response, and it grew out of hand before the fire department could get there because they had been busy already at other fires set by this group of arsonists. While this is burning, it's a couple guys I haven't mentioned. Joe Gorman was another arsonist. Joe was a rigger down at Quincy Shipyard. He actually uh, started going to fires with his dad when he was uh, about 10 years old. Uh, he had actually wanted to get on the state police. Uh, you had Lenny Kendall, who was Greg Bemis's best friend. Lenny went to the first two fires they set, but then he went into the Air Force, so he had a minimal part in the conspiracy. You see the uh, walls collapsing, and as my good friend Nat liked to tell me, they weren't retreating, they were repositioning. <laughs> There's certain words of fire business you don't use. <laughs> Matt, you want to? Yeah, this, as the uh, series of fires in Boston became uh, greater, Boston was heavily uh, covered by investigators out at night. So to uh, change things around, the uh, arson group would go to Quincy and set fires to uh, commercial buildings, usually in the rear and the wooden uh, shipping docks. So the arsonists would drive up from Quincy up to the North Shore to the Quincy, uh, Chelsea, Everett area along the River Beach Parkway and start setting buildings on the fire up there. I was up covering some of those fires all, all the towns were uh, stripped of apparatus when this fire started. The first engine in had, was from Linfield. So imagine an engine with two firefighters and two blocks of solid lumberyard fire. Uh, it uh, just took off. You know, the fire you, basically burned itself out. Yeah, another one that's a few hundred feet long. And this was a wood structure and as you can see, as they're pulling up, it was, it was gone already by the time they pulled up. And that's because they had already set other fires. And this was something that was going on. And by the middle of the summer, when we had this idea of starting to follow the pattern and going out with Boston, police, and fire, we saturated a certain area. Like there was the industrial area of South Boston. We had people, including myself, we were on top of some of the buildings and in the middle of the night and we're using binoculars. We got crews down in cars, and it would almost be like a stop and frisk type of thing. If you're in the neighborhood in the middle of the night, what are you doing here? So we were doing that to try to figure out the problem that we had. And uh, it funny part about that is there was not one single fire in our area while we're out there on surveillance. And that might be because Ray Norton, who's was on what they call light duty. He had an injury, so they put you on light duty. And he was working at headquarters where the Boston Austin squad was. I'm not saying he went into the file drawers because there wouldn't have been much in there to, to lead him to anything, but he could see outside that there were eight cars out that night ready to go out with ATF guys and Boston police and fill the streets. So what they did, they started moving. Like Nat said, they went to... They went to Norfolk County and set two fires that night, and they went up to you know, Chelsea, Everett, Revere area, area and set multiple fires there. And how could we follow anybody? How, did, how, how would we know about this? You already saw the pins, 107 fires around Boston, Suffolk County. So those pins, by the way, normally, if you got an arsonist, uh, a teenage kid in your neighborhood, 
he's going to set one across the street from his house maybe. And as he gets more comfortable, he'll go down the next block. And then he'll go two blocks over. And you can start to, you know, watch that circle go out a little wider and wider. And you can almost pinpoint the house where it started, from, where the person came from. In this case, you have eight guys who are thinking about, well, we work in a city. They, they lived everywhere. A couple of them lived in the city. A couple lived elsewhere, uh, south and northwest, all the way out to uh, Acton and Stowe. So, but they work. They know the streets. They know the firefighter operations. So they set one here, the first one that you saw. The second one was like a half mile away. And then the third one's over here, and the fourth one's over there. And if I blow that picture up for you and you look at the numbers, they are all over. There's no way that an investigative team could sit on one area and catch these people. Um, it, it almost need pure luck, an accident, um, something. You need a break. This particular fire has a little funny story attached to it. This is uh, the railroad yards. Just on the other side of uh, uh, downtown, almost South Boston edge. It's between Albany and South Boston. We're right there, the railroad yards, they come into South Station. So after they set these fires again, they would ride around and wait till a call came in and then respond back to it and watch the fire. So in this case, they went into Chinatown. And that intersection in Chinatown, bang. One car T-bones another, not theirs, but they're the first responders, and they were just doing their job. They helped the uh, victim. Nobody got hurt really badly at all, but one woman was drunk who was driving the car that hit the other, and she was trying to get away. So they restrained her until the cruiser came with a couple cops, Boston cops, and Bobby Grubuski was one of those guys, and he just turns this woman over to the uniform guys. And the uniform guy says, hey, there's a that big fire right down the street there. Guess what these guys did? The pride inside just caused them to smile. We did that, but not telling the cop. But we did that. So it became not just Proposition 2 and a half. By October, November, or 1983, a lot of people had been rehired. Uh, some fire companies opened, not all of them did. Um, it was the nightly entertainment, the addiction of setting these fires now. And that's why they went out there so often. Oh, I skipped ahead too much. This fire infuriated Mr. Whittemore. These are his, his videos, by the way. This is all his work. Not all. Like Sparrow Toy, what I mean is no people in them at this point. But Sparrow Toy had a business during the day. The lumber yards had businesses. The tire companies had businesses. And a few others. But uh, of the 264, I would say probably 200 were abandoned. Okay. The other ones were active businesses. This was called the Marine Barracks or the Enlisted Men's Club. And this was on E Street. Something different happened on this night. Right next door to this building was the Boston Bomb Squad. That's where they would have their office. These guys called Mass General with a bomb scare to get them to move so they could go set this fire. They went in the second floor. There was a, a way they got up to a second floor, put a device inside. It looked like it was going to be a crap fire. It wasn't going to progress. They took off to set other fires. They could hear on the radio that the second alarm, third alarm, ambulances being called, etc., because the roof collapsed with 22 firefighters coming down into the building, burned, broken backs, broken legs. I had two good friends who came to trial every day that never got back on the job, but they came to trial to see what was going on and didn't talk to one of those people again until Christmas time. We had tried to get him on Chronicle, but he called me at my house and told me that he couldn't do it because he still has PTSD from this, 35 years after the fact. 
Nat was filming this. Tell us, what were you thinking? This is one of the tough ones. It really, uh, really hit me what I saw on this one. That may be a good friend, uh, Manny Gregorio. Manny Gregorio. These two daughters are Boston fire alarm operators today. And uh, they didn't want to talk about it either. So this group of characters the next day had a meeting saying, did you hear, I mean, they're saying, we came so close to killing people. You can see how they're, even the rubber boots that they were wearing were burned as they lay trapped in the uh, burning rubbish of the whole roof collapse. The date up there was actually wrong. It was October 2nd, 1982. These guys were setting so many fires every month. October was the third most prolific month for them setting fires. Nearly 40 fires that month. Imagine how many of those were set after October 2nd after they nearly killed all these guys. So they had a meeting, said, we have to be more careful. They, they waited a day or two before they set another fire. And one of the first ones they set is like a four-story commercial brick building. What are they thinking? It could easily have caused the same type of problem, the collapse, and it could have killed people. It would have changed this whole dynamics of the case. Out of over 200 injured firefighters, but not one fatality. I get asked in the audience the second time in about two weeks. They went down to Providence, and it's, I have it in the book, because Providence around the 4th of July is famous for a lot of fires. Did these guys set any fires in Providence? Well, believe me, we asked them back in 1984 when they confessed, did they set any fires in Providence? And they said no. Um, it wouldn't have made any difference in a sense. The plea agreement with these guys is to be truthful. If we catch you in any lie, the plea is out the window, which means you're going to jail forever. So, end of day. Yes? Uh, I will tell you. You're going to be here a few more minutes? I'll, I'll tell you shortly. The importance of this fire, again, this is one of the ones that jumped outside the city. They went to Lowell in set three, Lawrence in set three, Fitchburg in set four, multiple alarm giant fires. This one here, where those column of flame is going to, you're going to see it again, uh, outside the building, they placed a device here. Now, the importance, I told you they changed the device. Well, they used the same thing, but they added something. Now, right down the bottom, towards the right side, is where they placed this one. And it had gas shingles on the outside. And about uh, a couple of three, four million dollars worth of Polaroid equipment inside. Now, being in Cambridge, our good friend, Ed Fowler, is the fire investigator. What do you see there? You see the remains at the bottom of a tire and steel belt. They started using abandoned tire, yeah, tires are just thrown in these lots all the time. Nobody knew what to do with a tire back then. So they threw them in abandoned lots. So they would throw three in a car any one night and place their device inside that tire well. So now you get the tire going against the side of the building. That's Mr. Fowler who's passed away since. And uh, they placed that inside a building or on the outside and it would make the fire grow more rapidly. The importance of that is now, the device as I described to you earlier, very difficult to find any remains of that device. 99% of it would burn up and then you add, I'm just going to let that, yeah. This is another one of the nights when they'd start down in Quincy setting fires and then they'd buzz up the expressway and start setting fires in the, the uh, Everett Chelsea 
Riviera area along Riviera Beach Parkway. This was another large lumber yard with a large uh, office building, uh, heavily involved. They'd set the other fires just to strip the cities of everything, and then they'd have a target building in this particular building or buildings. That was the target for the night. These guys were organized fire setters. They had the device, they had the plan. They would go around while they're working or during the day, and they would make lists of targets. So at night, they wouldn't waste as much time. But they'd make a list, and then they'd choose a couple other places and say, let's do these two first, and then we'll get this one. And just like he said, they pulled firefighters over this side and stripped them of manpower. Okay, now how do we catch these guys? You know, I had another serial larson case where it was actually a 75-year-old security guard guy who caught James Dix down on the South Shore, the Garden Country serial larsons. His hand was in the window pouring gasoline, and that's how he set 24, 25, 26 fires. And that's how he actually got caught. We were doing all sorts of work, surveillances, um, we were getting close to James himself, and that's how he gets caught. Well, sometimes pure luck like that helps. In this case, we had luck, but we also had the learned people like the Nat Whittemores and the Ed Fowlers who were out in the street, and they had their suspicions and their gut feelings, and it starts to come together on this date. And the reason we call it Garrity II this is Garrity Lumberyard in the Hyde Park Dedham Line, the Reedville section. It's because Garrity 1 happened about 30 days prior. They set it on fire once, and it was such a good fire, we set it on fire twice. Strange terminology for firefighters again is it's a good fire or a crappy fire. Look at the size of this. The first one was equally impressive. This uh, area formerly was the New York. So he went around. He was up there and he said, he yelled at the others, let's all pull our guns. And then he made the classic cross draw uh, holster and he pulled it out. I was wearing a vest and armed, so I just held my position, but I did think of taking shelter. I just planted my feet, and this was what helped break the case. That's off-duty police officer Robert Gabluski. The lump on the pile of lumber is Donald Stackpole, the nastiest guy in this group. He could never have been a firefighter. Uh, he had a lot of interest in being a fire buff and once upon a time wanted to be, and he's one of the ones that got rejected by the uh, Sparks Club. Uh, but 
I want uh, Richard Jewell, the guy who played Richard Jewell, I want him to play Donald Stackpole if this goes to film. This is Greg Bemis, They're leaning and uh, sitting uh, against a lump pile. So Bobby pulls his gun. Some knew Ray Norton, nobody knew Joe Gorman. So we chose to knock on the door of Bobby Grabluski. Cop to cop, law enforcement guys. You know, do you know anything? We knocked on his apartment door in Weymouth. He let us in, sat us down, and lied right to our faces. Uh, no, I'm a fire buff. I love to go to fires. I wanted to be a firefighter. And this is what I do. So he just lied, but not 10 feet away on the floor. Firebox number 1712, the very first one stolen in his apartment. Yep, on the floor. We raced back into Boston with Billy Murphy and I, my partner Billy, and we had a, he had a list on his desk that he wanted to go see. That's the first one stolen. And we didn't ask Bobby about it. Billy puts on his trench coat, his traditional tr trench coat. And uh, he says, oh, my grandfather or something, my father wanted to make bird cages or lamps out of these things or something. So just, in the room, just, like just sitting there right there on the floor, actually. Just, yeah, a collector's item. And because of that, we got a local search warrant. Boston PD didn't want to play with us going after one of their own, but we did get a local search warrant for receiving stolen property. It's all considered Boston property. So receiving stolen property, next day, or at most two days, we knock on the door, he's not there. Management lets us in. The box is still sitting there. We got no respect. Here we are investigating these fires, and he doesn't go hide it somewhere. You know, it's sitting right there. So we get that, and the Boston cops are pulling us out of the apartment. Like, okay, you got the box. That's it. No, our warrant says we can search for other items. And I'll tell you, it was not fun. Billy Murphy's father-in-law was the head of internal affairs in Boston. His father-in-law said to him, Billy, you're a persona non grata here at Boston PD for going after one of ours. Okay? Instead of doing the right thing, so they had an investigation. I'm going to put quotation marks around that word. Again, it's Bobby. Bobby came in and took a polygraph at the ATF office with an attorney. And I'll give him a double flunk. He flunked it so badly. I don't know what game he was trying to pull. Again, just the, the, the brashness, the, the audacity. Yeah, thank you, hon, <laughs> of these guys. She knows I fumble for words. So. He came in and his attorney said, after he flunked, he can't talk to you. He can't talk. That's it. We never talked to him again. Until, that happened the first week of December now, 1982. We talked to him January, not 1983, 1984. 1984. What happened in that time period? Well, I'll make it fairly brief, but we Fires were down in 1983, but they were still setting fires. They added the eighth arsonist, the, uh, the eighth guy who joined in to be an arsonist, actually joined around 1983. He worked for Donald Stackpole, who owned that security company. And they continued with a few more abandoned buildings, a few more commercial structures. <coughs> and we're still trying to put a case together. 
we knocked on the door of some of the other guys that we identified as friends of Grubalewski and torch, you know, not torches, fire butts. And one of those guys was Lieutenant Wayne Sandin. He was Boston Housing Authority police. You know, two Waynes on the same case, possibly on different sides of this whole thing. We don't have anything on these guys. I don't care what anybody thinks about them. I don't care that they're acting like idiots on a lumber pile, rooting for the home team. Who's the home team? Fire. The fire. The visitors are the firefighters. And that's what they would do, and that's why it irritated so many people. They'd be out there cheering for the home team. So it doesn't matter. We need evidence. We have to be able to arrest somebody with evidence. How do you follow these guys? They're law enforcement in the middle of the night and all over the place. You can't follow these guys. They would spot you in a minute. Back then, we had not very sophisticated equipment. And again, you had no GPS type of thing. We had a, what we called a bird dog we could put on something. But you could lose them three blocks down the road. Because you can't be on the same street with them in the middle of Roxbury in the middle of the night. That type of thing. So. We also still had other people that could be suspects. But we knocked on the door. I personally spoke to Wayne Sandin. He became a source of information for me. We can't have feds, I don't know if everybody else is like this, but you can't have a police officer as a true confidential informant. But he was a source of information, it's just not, he's not documented in the records as, as a confidential informant. But he gave me tidbits of information. Very hard to get close to this guy. I would talk to him on the phone. I'd meet with him on and off. Uh, oh, they burned an abandoned car that was stolen, stripped. A big deal, right? Uh, they burned, he burned an abandoned car. Late, much later on, he said they burned another abandoned car, caught on a building. Well, that's a little better. But he didn't tell me that he was present for that fire. He didn't tell me or even Judge Ryer Zobel when he confessed and pled guilty, eventually, that I was present for 50 of those fires. Never, ever, ever told me this to this day. And why did he give me this information? The next big break after the one that got us to talking to Gabluski, that got me talking to Wayne Sandin because of that video, the next break is when Wayne Sandin said they stole a brand new cruiser out of Natick Ford parking lot, unmarked, destined for Randolph, for a detective's car, to update their own personal cruisers with new parts. They took, like, the grill and the lights and put them on Bobby's car. And then, you know, recycling wasn't such a big deal, so they took the car and dumped it in the Four Point Channel. Less than 100 miles. Yes. And Wayne Sandin told me that. Why is this guy telling me that? I'm like a, that little fish out there on the, almost on the line. I'm just, I keep biting and nibbling, but I'm not getting anything, you know? And uh, he kept giving me this, and I don't know why he ever did this. I tried to talk to him after his arrest, but he wouldn't talk to me. So because of that information, that was August of 1983, we recovered with the Boston dive team the vehicle out of the water. And the parts that he said were missing were definitely missing. And it was the type of parts that were on Bobby's car. But we still were floundering. We didn't speak to Bobby till the night of January 12th, 1984, when a new supervisor in the group said, you guys need to focus. This has carried on way too long. No more running the fires. Let's get these guys, because they're the ones responsible. We interview him at Boston Police Headquarters, a very, very dramatic scene, let me tell you guys. We had a very experienced older agent who put the pressure verbally on Gabluski. There was uh, two detectives in Boston, the deputy superintendent, myself, and Jimmy Carroll, he's the older agent. It'll make a great movie scene. Well, tell him what Bobby was doing up there. But, uh, after. After uh, the gun waving incident and the search warrant,
Bobby was taken off the street and put up what they call a turret. Uh, the, the rubber gun squad. He calls it the rubber gun squad. The turret is dispatch area, Boston PD. He was still a cop while they were so-called investigating him for another 14 months. Investigation doesn't take that long. So, so because of the stolen car, we had Bobby sitting the furthest away from the door to the room. He could leave. He wasn't under arrest. But we made it more difficult because he sat further away. And a conversation from Jimmy Carolides, who actually was a thespian. He had a card. He did plays. He was a card-carrying actor. Okay, And Jimmy was so magnificent in his three-piece suit. But I'm not going to tell you exactly what he said and how it went down. But when Bobby lifted his head and said, what do you want to know? Gave us 29 fires in fairly rapid order. And my head was spinning. My stomach was turning over. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. We grabbed him away from Boston PD because we know what the feeling is there, even so the deputy superintendent and the detectives were on our side helping us. We brought him over to our Battery March building in Boston. We're on the 11th floor. And well after midnight, we placed a phone call to the U.S. Attorney's Office. They have a 24-hour number. Can we get a U.S. Attorney out here to help us make sure we do everything right? We already got some confession on tape. So they sent over an assistant U.S. attorney, the number two man under Bill Well, Robert Mueller. <laughs> Things come around, don't they? <laughs> so Mr. Mueller came over and he said, you have to arrest this guy. We don't know if he's going to commit suicide, if he's going to go out and tell everybody else uh, what's going to happen. So we arrested him at about 3.24 a.m., give or take a few seconds. I had the pleasure of reading him his rights and placing him under arrest. It was now Friday the 13th. <laughs> it was. And uh, unlucky for him, for, rather lucky for the investigation team. From that point on till May, we didn't get to speak to Bobby again because he had an attorney in federal court the next day who said no. We didn't get to speak to him again. And he went, got back out in the street with bail and talked to his buddies and lied to their faces. I, I wasn't in federal court. I, wasn't, I didn't do this. I didn't plead guilty eventually. I didn't do this. And they believed him over and over again. He was so good at it. When he finally lost his suppression hearing to try to suppress his confession because we did such a nice job on tape, it was just like we'd be talking in a room together. And he'd be telling us a story. No pressure, no nothing. His rights read to him on tape. Everything was so nice, the judge said, they didn't coerce you. So in May, he hired another famous person as his attorney. Anybody watch ABC, NBC, uh, et cetera, et cetera? I saw, we saw her last night, the night before. Ricky Kleeman? The uh, wife of a former Boston, uh, New York City Police Commission. New York City, L.A. LA. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bratton, his, his wife. And she, she's an uh, expert consultant on TV now. But uh, she said, you don't have much of a case here, Bobby. He, Bobby wanted to help us, and he did. He wore a wire 17 times for us, did undercover work for us, 17 occasions. Half of those were face-to-face -face meetings. The other half were by telephone. We recorded all these conversations. And one of those live in person ones down at Stackpole's house in Situate, rather dramatic. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you about it because it'll make great movie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a lot of fun doing this case. Uh, a lot of, once the arrests of Grublewski happened, we didn't slow down. We ramped up. We had the entire arson group in Boston working with us every day, verifying corroborating his information, trying to get more information on the other guys, and trying to build a case, and trying to face that suppression hearing. And then leading up to the arrest in, 19, in July of 84 of the rest of the characters. Now, there's a ninth character. How did that happen? 
Poor Chris Damon, former friend of Donald Stackpole. He had moved to Ohio. Stackpole, very nervous about Grubluski, calls Chris and says, hey, Chris, could you do me a favor? Could you maybe house Bobby and get him a job out there? And Chris was a little reluctant, but Donald called him a couple times. And Chris said, OK, I will. Well, now he's part of the conspiracy and obstruction of justice. And he gets a few counts. And he went to prison. He got two to four. That was Chris Damon. The only one who didn't go to prison was Lenny Kendall, the young friend of Bemis, who came in for the first two fires but did not set one. He actually sat in the car. He went into the Air Force to get veterans' preference and become an Air Force firefighter so when he got out, he could be a Boston firefighter. Well, that didn't happen for him. He was actually in England when this was coming down. We brought him back to Georgia and then to Boston. And it's the long arm of the law, right? That was extra long. Uh, so he got uh, probation. Greg Bemis. While I was sitting in prison with a couple of these guys and they started talking about murdering witnesses, he said, I had enough. He came in. He signed an agreement for 30 years. But sentencing guidelines in Boston, which are not the same today, you don't have federal parole like today, uh, like back then. Uh, you, you're eligible for parole after 10 years. And he spent just over 10. But he testified in two trials. The two trials were Ray Norton, a Boston firefighter, who was very arrogant and another nasty person who felt that he had a lot to lose, his pension and everything else, too, so he fought it. He didn't actually set a fire either, but they used his house for an office at, on occasion and to build one device, and he pointed out right across the street the uh, sand and gravel company. That'd be a good place to burn, and a couple other places, and he was part of the conspiracy all the way around. He got four to six. He is now a convicted pedophile. We had some suspicions back then when the 10 to 12 year old kids, and I actually got an email from one of his victims uh, who wrote me an extremely long email and detailed uh, some of that for me recently, only just a few weeks ago. Um, Grabluski, the Boston cop, he got a 12 year sentence and did just over 10. He was the first one in the door he did a great job, undercover, and he did a decent job. He didn't do as well as Bemis testifying, but he did a decent job. Uh, Stackpole, he got 40-year sentence. He did about 22, and as I say, he's now permanently housed in the Braintree Cemetery. Um, Joe Gorman got like four to six. He was in and out of the conspiracy, never actually set a fire himself. Uh, who am I missing? Oh, Mark Svenby was that eighth arsonist who came in in 1983. He actually eventually confessed too uh, and assisted in some way, but he got a four to six for his small part. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, like Stackpole, we only charged 19 fires. We could have charged 100, but you know the evidence gets long and the trial gets really long. It's a 17-day trial as it was. You got a conspiracy of 264 fires. You got this charge for obstruction and this one for lying and to, to uh, the grand jury, it's stuff like that. But we chose to only charge those fires that we could have not only a confession, but have two other corroborating pieces of evidence instead of charging a whole bunch and people would get tired and juries and just too long. So he didn't get charged with 264 except in the conspiracy. So the jurors knew they were involved with that. But you get 10 years for each potential fire. So he got charged with 19. So you could have gotten 190 years. But any of those ones where you had firefighters hurt, it increases it by double. It could have been 20 years sentence. So he could have been in there for about 312 years or something. But that's not what happens in real life. One of the things that happened when Judge Ryas Obell sentenced them, called them truly urban terrorists, 
term that was not used in those days. Go ahead, Kathy. Yep. I am. I'm, I'm at the end. Yep. Sure. Go ahead, ma'am. That's, that's a good question. And you, it doesn't get asked very often. At my, this is like my number 31, 32 event. Um, I did not speak to one insurance person this entire case. And that's, I went on the private side after the last 18 years. And my first call, I went to a fire last week. My first call was Quincy Fire Department that before I went out to the fire. And I'm on the insurance side. But that didn't happen here. So uh, some were owned by the city, but yet, like the Ziola brothers owned that building with the Boston Sparks. We had them testify, but I had no contact with insurance. Uh, they weren't going to get money out of these guys anyway. They didn't own that much. I mean, Stackpole owned a house. Grabluski eventually owned a house. I don't think any of the other characters owned a house. So you, they weren't going to get much out of them. So, you know, they didn't get, insurance companies didn't get Zippo. Please, questions. Where did that first box? We, end, we ended up recovering bunches of them out of uh, the Four Point Channel and uh, Assabet River. Boston Harbor. Well, they were off near the channel, Boston Harbor, but some came out of the river too. The Four Point Channel. But some came out of the river near uh, Acton, Assabet or something like that. Uh, it was used during trial as an exhibit, and I have no idea what happened to it. No idea. Yes. Uh, Wayne, were you um, at any point during the trial nervous about or concerned about uh, the possibility that uh, enough evidence or the hard investigative work that had been done um, would either be suppressed or that any of the convictions might not have happened? Uh, the two trials, again, Norton and Stackpole, and both of them were about 17 days. And again, after the arrest of Gabluski up through these trials, which was November and uh, February uh, 85, and we worked our butts off. And we were putting this t case together with uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney Mark Robinson and Ralph Gantz. Ralph Gantz is now your uh, state Supreme Court Chief Justice. So very brilliant minds. And uh, with that, type of evidence that we wanted. We wanted to have these guys testify, but I'll tell you, when Grubluski was getting beaten up on, especially in the second trial by uh, Zalkine, attorney Jack Zalkine, and he was getting beat up around the head and ears, you know, getting bruised regularly. And we tried to, had to rehabil rehabilitate him is what it's called on our end. I was worried at that time he was really making headway that we were gonna lose count after count. Um, most of the other time I was, mostly confident that we had a good case. Um, Stackpole, we lost the count for this fire. This picture, I put up on my wall next to my desk at ATF for the next 19 years. Because I said, we could lose this fire, I have to work harder. And that's what the picture was there for. They give me incentive to work harder. But uh, we lost that count and like one other. It, it got confusing. The defense attorneys didn't have a lot to work with, but they did the best they could. Yes, sir. Um, Billy's father-in-law finally apologized to Billy, but, uh, and uh, Jack Gifford was the deputy superintendent at the time, which I became friendly with uh, back in 81, 80, before this case started. And Jack was the one who was in the room when Bobby confessed, and he's the one who helped set it up for us that meeting. He did a great job, and he was, you know, just trying to get the job done right. 
uh, Boston police, and Boston, Boston Fire never, you know, remember we got a Boston firefighter. They never gave us any real grief either, but I heard since that they had turned their back quite a few times to some of the guys and said, you know, this is helping the department somewhat, you know, that type of thing. But they never gave us grief. Um, and I never, I worked, all worked with Boston PD years after, and I think they forgave us all. Um, what happens in these cases is people can't believe that they're involved, and not just because they're police officers, but um, a neighbor of ours, a retired Boston firefighter he, for years, lived in the two, di two family with Wayne Sandin. And when it happened, um, he couldn't believe that Wayne Sandin was involved. And, you know, one of our agents got spit on by Wayne Sandin's sister for going after him, persecuting him, you know, when he pleads guilty and never confesses. Yes, ma'am. Did you work with Matt when you were working on the original case? Because I know that you were involved in that case. I don't think I worked with Nat before November 21st. Yeah. Um, at some point, I knew Ed Fowler, but I can't say directly when it happened. But after November 21st, uh, we, we had some conversations afterwards. And that's when I found out that, you know, Ed, Ed's the type of guy, he's an investigator, but behind that column over there, he'd see an arsonist. And over there, he'd see an arsonist. And you need somebody who has that gut feeling. He's, those, those guys are close to the streets. The feds aren't. You know, we need state and local guys. And they're the ones who have the feel for who's out there and who's not right. Um, so we work with them in that fashion afterwards. Was this the first time this is an investigative report? Not guilty. Uh, was this the first time you had ever encountered anybody in law enforcement or firefighting uh, who you suspected of wrongdoing? And if so, if or even if it wasn't, can you describe the, the visceral feeling that you had while you were in the process of the investigation? Well, the Eisen Group only got formed right about then. Right. And, you know, prior to that, I was doing gun cases, buying guns on the streets of Boston. I was working undercover and stuff like that. I, I tell people I know exactly where I was, what bar in Hyde Park on River Street I was when Elvis died. The night of his day. <laughs> but uh, in, in, as far as the arson business, in this case, we actually, there was a, a group of fires in Jamaica Plain during this whole thing, and these guys were setting fires everywhere. But we did a surveillance one night in Jamaica Plain. That first night, this kid, we didn't know this kid, Michael McDonald, from anywhere. But we caught him in the act of setting some fires, and he was totally different. And it was... It was a rush to make that quick arrest, but we knew it wasn't the problem. We knew it wasn't this. Uh, I had severe frustration during that time period, and I was getting tired. Matter of fact, I ended up with pneumonia, and I couldn't work for a couple of weeks um, because of all the hours we were putting in. And, um, you know, the elation when finally Bobby confessed, and again, I was feeling that thing going on in my head and my stomach. Um, it was fun, and when the case ended, it was fun. Um, I had other serial arsonists who I developed as suspects in other cases, and knowing that you like a bloodhound on the track and trying to catch that person actually with enough evidence is a puzzle, is a game, um, a real life game, but it gets your juices flowing.